starting with chapter 19. <clears throat> Sitting in a chair near the hearth of the Great Hall, Caltaine watched Duke Parrington converse with Queen Georgina atop her dais. It'd been a shame that Dorian had left so quickly an hour ago. She hadn't even had the chance to speak to him, which was especially irksome, given that she had spent the better part of the morning dressing for court. Her raven black hair was neatly coiled around her head, and her skin glowed golden from the subtle, shimmering powers she dusted on her face. Though the bindings on her pink and yellow gown crushed her ribs, and the pearls and diamonds around her neck strangled her, she kept her chin high, poised. Dorian had left, but having Par Parrington show up was an unexpected surprise. The Duke rarely visited court. This had to be important. Keltane rose from her chair by the fire as the Duke bowed to the Queen and strode toward the doors. As she stepped in into his path, he paused at the sight of her, his eyes gleaming with a hunger that made her want to cringe. He bowed low. Milady, Your Grace, she smiled, forcing all the repulsion down deep, deep, deep. I hope you're well, he said, offering his arm to lead her out of the hall. She smiled again, taking it. Though he was somewhat rotund, hard muscle lay in the arm beneath her hand. Very well, thank you. And yourself? I feel like I haven't seen you in days and days. What a wonderful surprise to have you visit the court. Parrington gave her a yellow smile. I've missed you as well, milady. She tried not to wince as his hairy, meaty fingers rubbed her pristine skin and instead delicately inclined her head toward him. I hope Her Majesty was in good health. Was your conversation a pleasant one? Well, it was so dangerous to pry, especially when she was here on his good graces. Meeting him last spring had been a stroke of luck, and convincing him to invite her to court, mostly by implying what might await him once she was out of her father's household and without a chaperone, hadn't been that difficult. But she wasn't here to simply enjoy the pleasures of the court. No, she was tired of being a minor lady, waiting to be married off to the highest bidder, tired of petty politics and easy manipulated food, fools. Her Majesty is quite well, actually, Parrington. Harrington said, leading Caltaine toward her rooms. Her stomach clenched a bit, though he didn't hide that when that he wanted her, he hadn't pushed her into bed. Yet. But with a man like Parrington, who always got what he wanted, she didn't have much time to find a way to avoid owning up to the subtle promise she'd made him earlier that year. But, the Duke went on, with a son of marriageable age, she's busy. Caltaine kept her face plain, calm, serene. Can we expect any news of an engagement in the near future? Another dangerous question. I certainly hope so, the Duke grumbled, his face darkening beneath his ruddy hair. The jagged scar along his cheek stood out starkly. Her Majesty already has a list of girls deemed appropriate. The Duke halted, remembering whom he spoke to, and Keltane batted her eyelashes at him. Oh, I'm quite sorry, she purred. I didn't mean to pry into the royal household's affairs. She patted his arm her heart kicking into a full gallop. Dorian had been given a list of appropriate brides? Who was on it? And how could she... No, she'd think of that later. For now, she had to find out who stood between her and the crown. It's nothing to apologize for, he said, his dark eyes shining. Come, tell me what you've been doing these past few days. Not much of note, though I met a very interesting young woman, she said casually, leading him down a window-lined stairway into the glass section of the castle. A friend of Dorian's, the Lady Lillian, he called her. The Duke went positively rigid. You met her? Oh yes, she's quite kind. The lie rolled off her tongue. When I spoke to her today, she mentioned how much the Crown Prince likes her. I hope for her sake she was on the Queen's list. While she'd wanted some information about Lillian, she hadn't expected this. The Lady Lillian? Of course she isn't. The poor thing, I suspect her heart will be broken. I know it's not my place to pry, she went on, the Duke growing redder and more furious by the moment. But I heard it not an hour ago from Dorian himself that... That what? A thrill went through her at his anger. Not anger at her, but at Lillian. At the weapon she just had the good fortune to stumble across. That he's very attracted to her, possibly in love with her. That's absurd. It's true! She gave a morose shake of the head. How tragic. Foolish is what it is. The Duke stopped at the end of the hallway that led to Caltaine's room. Thank you for the cat ears, Chaz. <laughs>
Eh, hold on, hold on. I need to. Eh. Eh. I need to not lose what page I'm at, but also use both hands to put on the cat ears. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, that led to Keltane's room. His anger loosened his tongue. Foolish and daft and impossible. Impossible? Someday I will explain why. A clock chime, off kilter, and Parrington turned in its direction. I have a council meeting. He leaned close enough to whisper in her ear, his breath hot and damp against her skin. Perhaps I'll see you tonight. He dragged a hand down her side before he walked away. She watched him go, and when he disappeared, she let out a shuddering sigh. But if he could get her close to Dorian... She had to find out who her competition was, but first she had to find a way to get Lillian's claws out of the prince. List or no list, she was a threat. And if the Duke hated her as much as it seemed, she might have powerful allies when the time came to make sure Lillian released her hold on Dorian. Dorian Kale didn't say much as they walked to dinner in the Great Hall. Princess Nehemia was safely in her chambers, surrounded by her guards. It had been quickly agreed that while it was foolish of Selena to spar with the princess, Kale's op absence was inexcusable, even with the dead champion to investigate. You seemed rather friendly with Sardothian, Kale said, his voice cold. Jealous, are we? Dorian teased. I'm more concerned for your safety. She might be pretty and might impress you with her cleverness, but she's still an assassin, Dorian. You sound like my father. It's common sense. Stay away from her, champion or no. Don't give me orders. I'm only doing it for your safety. Why would she kill me? I think she likes being pampered. If she hasn't attempted to escape or kill anyone, then why would she do it now? He patted his friend on the shoulder. You worry too much. It's my occupation to worry. Then you'll have gray hair before you're 25, and Sardothian certainly will not fall in love with you. What nonsense are you talking? Well, if she does try to escape, which she won't, then she'll break your heart. You'd be forced to throw her in the dungeons, hunt her down, or kill her. Dorian, I don't like her. Sensing his friend's growing irritation, Dorian changed the subject. What about the dead champion? The Eye Eater? Any idea who did it, or why? Kale's eyes darkened. I've studied it again and again over the past few days. The body was totally destroyed. The color leashed from Kale's cheeks. Innard scooped out and gone. Even the brain was... missing. I've sent a message to your father about it, but I'll continue investigating in the meantime. I bet it was just a drunken brawl, Dorian said, though he had been in plenty of brawls himself and had never known anyone to go about removing someone's innards. A trickle of fear formed in the back of Dorian's mind. My father would probably be glad to have the Eye Eater dead and gone. I hope so. Dorian grinned and put an arm around the captain's shoulders. With you looking into it, I'm sure it'll be solved tomorrow, he said, leading his friend into the dining hall. And that was chapter 19. I did not set a timer for my ears. <laughs> I guess I'll set one now, unless Apple did. Apple, did you set a timer? You did? Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay, then. Uh, awesome. Alright, well then, let's move into chapter 20. Selena closed her book inside. What a terrible ending. She stood from the chair, unsure where she was going, and walked out of her bedroom. She'd been willing to apologize to Kaol when he found her sparring with Nehemia that afternoon, but his behavior... She paced through her rooms. He had more important things to do than guard the world's most famous criminal, did he? She didn't enjoy being cruel, but hadn't he deserved it? She'd really made a fool out of herself by mentioning the vomiting, and she'd called him all sorts of nasty things. Did he trust her or hate her? Selena looked at her hands and realized she had wrung them so badly that her fingers were red. How had she gone from the most feared prisoner in Endovier to this sappy mess? She had greater matters to worry about. Like the test tomorrow. And this dead champion. She'd already altered 
the hinges on all her doors so that they squeaked loudly any time they opened. If someone entered her room, she'd know well in advance. And she'd managed to embed some stolen sewing needles into a bar of soap for a makeshift, mini makeshift miniature pipe. It was better than nothing, especially if this murderer had a taste for champion blood. She forced her hands to her sides, shaking her unease, and strode into the music and gaming room. She could not play billiards or cards by herself, but... Selena eyed the piano forte. She used to play. Oh, she loved to play. Loved music. The way music could break and heal and make everything seem possible and heroic. Carefully, as if approaching a sleeping person, Selena walked to the large instrument. She pulled out the wooden bench, wincing at the loud scraping sound it made. Folding back the heavy lid, she pushed her feet on the pedals, testing them. She eyed the smooth ivory keys, and then the black keys, which were like the gaps between teeth. She had been good once, perhaps better than good. Arab and Hamill made her play for him whenever they saw each other. She wondered if Arabin knew she was out of the mines. Would he try to free her if he did? She still didn't dare to face the possibility of who might have betrayed her. Things had been such a haze when she'd been captured. In two weeks, she'd lost Sam and her own freedom, and lost something of herself in those blurry days, too. Sam. What would he make of all this? If he'd been alive when she was captured, he would have had her out of the royal dungeons before the king even got word of her imprisonment. But Sam, like her, had been betrayed, and sometimes the absence of him hit her so hard that she forgot how to breathe. She touched a lower note. It was deep and throbbing, full of sorrow and anger. Gingerly, with one hand, she tapped out a simple, slow melody on the higher keys. Echoes, shreds of memory arising out of the void of her mind. Her rooms were so silent that the music seemed obtrusive. She moved her right hand, playing upon the flats and sharps. It was a piece that she used to play again and again until Arabin would yell at her to play something else. She played a chord, then another, added a few silver notes from her right hand, pushed once on a pedal, and was gone. The notes burst from her fingers, staggering at first, but then more confidently as the emotion in the music took over. It was a mournful piece, but ma it made her into something clean and new. She was surprised that her hands had not forgotten, that somewhere in her mind, after a year of darkness and slavery, music was still alive and breathing. That somewhere, between the notes, was Sam. She forgot about the time as she drifted between pieces, voicing the unspeakable, opening old wounds, playing and playing as the sound forgave and saved her. Leaning against the doorway, Dorian stood, utterly transfixed. She'd been playing for some time with her back to him. He wondered when she'd notice him, or if she'd ever stop at all. He wouldn't mind listening forever. He had come here with the intention of embarrassing the snide assassin, and had instead found a young woman pouring her secrets into a pianoforte. Dorian peeled himself from the wall. For all her assassinating experience, she didn't notice him until he sat down on the bench beside her. You play bu- Her fingers slipped on the keys, which let out a loud, awful clank, and she was halfway to the rack of hue sticks when she beheld him. He could have sworn her eyes were damp. What are you doing here? She glanced at the door. Was she planning on using one of those cue sticks to against him? Kale isn't with me, he said with a quick smile. If that's what you're wondering. I apologize if I interrupted. He, wonder he wondered at her discomfort as she turned red. It seemed far too human emotion for Adderlin's assassin. Perhaps his earlier plan to embarrass her wasn't foiled yet. But you were playing so beautifully that I... It's fine. She walked toward one of the chairs. He stood, blocking her path. She was of a surprisingly average height. He glanced down at her form. Average height aside, her curves were enticing. What are you doing here? She repeated. He smiled, he smiled roguishly. We decided to meet tonight, don't you remember? I thought it was a joke. I'm Crown Prince of Adderland. He sank into a chair before the fire. I never joke. Are you allowed to be here? Allowed? Again, I'm a prince. I can do what I like. Yes. But I'm Adderlin's assassin. He wouldn't be intimidated, even if she could grab that billiards cue and skewer him in a matter of seconds. From your playing, it seems that you're a great deal more than that. What do you mean? Well, he said, trying not to get lost in her strange, lovely eyes. I don't think anyone who plays like that can be just a criminal. It seems like you have a soul, he teased. Of course I have a soul. Everyone has a soul. She was still red. He made her that... 
He made her that uncomfortable? He fought his grin. This was too much fun. How'd you like the books? They were very nice, she said quietly. They were wonderful, actually. I'm glad. Their eyes met, and she retreated behind the back of the chair. If he didn't know better, he would have thought that himself to be the assassin. How's training going? Any competitors giving you trouble? Excellently, she said, but the corners of her mouth drifted downward. And no, after today, I don't think any of us will be giving anyone trouble. It took him a moment to realize she was thinking of the competitor who had been killed while trying to escape. She chewed on her bottom lip quiet for a heartbeat before she asked, Did Carol give the orders to kill Sven? No. No, he said. My father commanded all the guards to shoot to kill if any of you tried to escape. I don't think Kale would have ever given that order, he added, though he wasn't sure why, but the unnerving stillness in her eyes abated at least. When she didn't say more, Dorian asked as casually as he could, on that note, how are you and Kale getting along? Of course it was a totally innocent question. She shrugged, and he tried not to read too far into the gesture. Fine, I think he hates me a bit, but given his position, I'm not surprised. Why do you think he hates you? For some reason, he couldn't bring himself to deny it. Because I'm an assassin, and he's captain of the guard, forced to belittle himself by mind, by minding the would-be king's champion. Do you wish it were otherwise? He gave her a lazy grin. That question wasn't so innocent. She inched around the chair, coming closer to him, and his heart jumped a beat. Well, who wants to be hated? Though I'd rather be hated than invisible. But it makes no difference. She wasn't convincing. You're lonely? He said it before he could stop himself. Lonely? She shook her head and finally, after all that coaxing, sat down. He fought against the urge to reach across the space between them to see if her hair was as silky as it looked. No, I can serve well enough on my own, if given proper reading material. He looked at the fire, trying not to think about where she'd been only weeks before and what, ki what that kind of loneliness might have felt like. There were no books in Endovier. Still, it can't be pleasant to be one's own companion at all times. And what would you do? She left. I'd rather not be seen as one of your lovers. And what's wrong with that? I'm already notorious as an assassin. I don't particularly feel like being notorious for sharing your bed. He choked, but she went on. Would you like me to explain why, or is it enough for me to say that? I don't take jewels and trinkets as payment for my affection. He snarled. I'm not going to debate morality with an assassin. You kill people for money, you know. Her eyes became hard, and she pointed to the door. You may leave now. You're dismissing me? He didn't know whether to laugh or yell. Shall I summon Kael to see what he thinks? She crossed her arms, knowing she had won. Perhaps she'd also realized that there was fun to be had in riling him, too. Why should I be thrown from your rooms for stating the truth? You just called me little more than a whoremonger. He hadn't had this much fun in ages. Tell me about your life. How you learned to play the piano forte so masterfully. And what was that piece? It was so sad. Were you thinking about a secret lover? He winked. I practiced. She stood, walking toward the door. And yes, she snapped. I was. You're quite prickly tonight, he said, trailing her. He stopped a foot away, but the space between them felt strangely intimate, especially as he purred. You're not nearly as chatty as you were this afternoon. I'm not some odd commodity that you can gawk at. She stepped closer. I'm not some carnival exhibit, and you won't use me as part of some unfulfilled desire for adventure and excitement, which is undoubtedly why you chose me to be your champion. His mouth fell open and he conceded a step. What? Was all he managed. She stalked past him and dropped into the armchair. At least she wasn't leaving. Did you honestly think I wouldn't realize why you came here tonight as someone who gave me the crown of a hero to read? Which suggests a rather fanciful mind that yearns for adventure. I don't think you're an adventurer, he muttered. Oh, the castle offers so much excitement that the presence of Adderland's assassin isn't nothing unusual? Nothing that would entice a young prince who's been confined to a court all his life? And what does his comp this competition suggest, for that matter? I'm already your father's at your father's disposal. I won't become his son's gesture, too. It was his turn to blush. He had, had he never been scolded by anyone like this? His parents and tutors, perhaps, but certainly not a young woman. Don't you know who you're talking to? My dear prince, she drawled, examining her nails. You're alone in my rooms. The hallway door is very far away. I can say whatever I wish. 
He burst out laughing. She sat up and watched him, her head tilted to the side. Her cheeks were flushed, making her blue eyes even brighter. Did she know that he might have wanted what he might have wanted to do with her if she wasn't an assassin? I'll go, he said at last, stopping himself from wondering if he could actually risk it, risk his father's and Kale's wrath, and what might happen if he decided to damn the consequences. But I'll return. Soon. I'm sure, she said dryly. Good night, Sardothian. He looked around her rooms and grinned. Tell me something before I leave. This mystery lover of yours. He doesn't live in the castle, does he? He instantly knew he'd said the wrong thing when some of the light vanished from her eyes. Good night, she said a bit coldly. Dorian shook his head. I didn't mean to. She just waved him off, looking toward the fire. Understanding his dismissal, he strode to the door, each of his footsteps sounding in the now too silent room. He was almost at to the threshold when she spoke, her voice distant. His name was Sam. She was still staring at the fire. Was? Sam? What happened? She looked at him, smiling sadly. He died. When? He got out. He would have never teased her like that. Never said a damn word if he'd known. Her words were strangled as she said, 13 months ago. A glimmer of pain flashed across her face, so real and endless that he felt it in his gut. I'm sorry, he breathed. She shrugged, as if it could somehow diminish the grief he still saw in her eyes, shining so bright in the firelight. So am I, she whispered, and faced the fire again. Sensing she was truly done talking this time, Dorian cleared his throat. Good luck at tomorrow's test. She didn't say anything as he left the room. He couldn't banish her heart-wrenching music from his mind, even when he burned his mother's list of eligible maidens, even when he read a book long into the night, even when he finally fell asleep. That was chapter 21. I mean, 20. <laughs> I read 21 as I looked down. Apple, what are those eyes for? <clears throat> so about these book series um there's actually an artist who has um written and sang some songs that are based on um Hold on, I got distracted. Okay, that's odd. Um, I got sent a picture from Chaz. Uh, that are that is kind of funny. Anyways, um, but yeah, there's a um, he was thinking about risking it all. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's an artist who writes and sings songs that are based on this book series. And one of the ones that she did was um, a piano forte piece um, that was done in reference to what she believes that Selena was playing on the piano. And I think that's really interesting. It's a really good piece. Uh, I could probably send it to you guys after the after the stream, but it's really nice. But anyways, I digress. Let's move into chapter twenty one. <laughs> Selena dangled from the stone wall of the castle, her legs trembling as she dug her tar-covered fingers and toes into the cracks between the giant blocks. Brulo shouted something at the other 19 remaining champions scaling the castle walls, but from 70 feet up, the wind carried his words away. One of the champions hadn't shown up for the test, and even his guards hadn't known where he went. Maybe he'd actually managed to escape. Risking it seemed better than his this miserably stupid test anyway. She gritted her teeth inching her hand upward and pulled herself up another foot. 20 feet up and about 30 feet away flapped the object of this insane race, a golden flag. The test was simple, climb to the, the castle to where the flag waved 90 feet in the air to retrieve it. First one who grabbed the flag and brought it back down received a pat on the back. Last one to reach the designated spot would be sent back to wherever gutter they came from. 
Surprisingly, no one had fallen yet, perhaps because the path to the flag was fairly easy. Balconies, windowsills, and trellises covered most of the space. Selena scooted up another few feet, her fingers aching. Looking down was always a bad idea, even if Erebin had forced her to stand on the ledge of his assassin's keep for hours on end to become accustomed to heights. She panted as she grasped another window ledge and hoisted herself up. It was deep enough that she could crouch within, and she took a moment to, sturdy, to study the other champions. Sure enough, Kane was in the lead, and had taken the easiest path toward the flag. Graven Varen was on his trail, Knox close behind, and Paler, the young assassin, not far below him. There were so many competitors following him that their gear often got tangled together. They'd each been given the opportunity to select one object to aid them in their ascent. Rope, spikes, special boots, and sure enough, Kane had gone right for the rope. She'd taken a small tin of tar, and as Selena rose from her crouch in the windowsill, her sticky black hands and bare feet easily gripped the stone wall. She'd used some rope to strap the tin to her belt, and before she stepped out of the shade of the sill, she rubbed a little more on her palms. Someone gasped below, and she swallowed the urge to glance down. She knew she'd taken a more difficult path, but it was better than fighting off all of the competitors taking the easy route. She wouldn't put it past Grave or Baron to shove her off the wall. Her hands suctioned to the st onto the stone, and Selena heaved herself upward, just in time to hear a shriek, a thump, and then silence followed by the shouting of onlookers. A competitor had fallen and died. She looked down and beheld the body of Ned Clement, the murderer who'd call him, called himself the Scythe and spent years in the labor camps of Caterpillar for his crimes. A shudder went through her. Though the murder of the Eye Eater had made many of the champions quiet down, the sponsor certainly didn't seem to care that this test might very well kill a few more of them. She shimmied up a drain pipe her thighs clinging to the iron. Kane hooked his long rope around a leering gargoyle's neck and swung across an expanse of flat wall, landing on a balcony ledge 15 feet below the flag. She fought her frustration as she worked her way up a higher and higher, following the course of the drain pipe. The other competitors shuffled along, following Kane's path. There were a few more shouts, and she looked down long enough to see that Grave was causing a backup because he couldn't manage to toss his rope around the gargoyle's neck as Kane had. Varen nudged the assassin behind, uh, an assassin aside and moved past him, easily securing his own rope. Knox, now behind Grave, made to do the same, but Grave started cursing at him and Knox stopped, lifting his hands in a gesture of placation. Smirking, Selena braced her blackened feet on a, a stabilizing bracket, holding the pipe in place. She'd soon be directly parallel to the flag, and then only 30 feet of bare stone would separate her from it. Selena eased farther up the pipe her toes sticking to the metal. Fifteen feet below her pipe, a mercenary was clutching the horns of a gargoyle as he set about fastening his rope around its head. He seemed to be taking the faster route across the, a cluster of gargoyles. Then he'd have to swing onto a landing eighteen feet away before making his way to the other gargoyles on which Grave and Knox now quarreled. She was in no danger of him trying to scale the drain pipe to bother her, so inch by inch she moved up, the wind battering her hair this way and that. It was then that she heard Knox shout, and Selena looked in time to see Grave shove him from their perch atop the gargoyle's back. Knox swung wide, the rope wrapped around his middle going taut as he collided with the castle wall below. Selena froze, her breath catching as Knox scraped his hands and feet against the stone to catch hold. But Grave wasn't done yet. He bent under the guise of adjusting his boot, and Selena saw a small dagger glint in the sunlight. How he'd gotten the weapon past his guards was a feat in itself. Selena's warning cry was carried away by the wind as Grave set about sawing Knox's rope from its tether on the gargoyle. None of the other champions nearby bothered to do anything, though Paler paused for a moment before easing around Grave. If Knox died, it was one less competitor, and if they interfered, it might cost them this test. Selena knew she could keep moving. She should, she should keep moving, but something kept her rooted to the spot. Knox couldn't find a hold on the stone wall, and without a nearby ledge or gargoyle to grasp, he had nowhere to go but down. Once the rope broke, he'd fall. One by one, the threads of his rope snapped beneath Grave's dagger, and Knox, sensing the vibrations, looked up at the assassin in horror. If he fell, there was no chance of surviving. A few more slices of Grave's blade, and the rope would be severed entirely. The rope groaned. Selena moved. She slid down the drain pipe 
the flesh of her feet and hands tearing open as the metal cut into her skin, but she didn't let herself think of the pain. The mercenary was on the gargoyle below only... The mercenary on the gargoyle below only had time to lean into the wall as she slammed into the creature's head, gripping its horns to steady herself. The mercenary had already tied one end of his climbing rope around the gargoyle's neck. Now she seized it and tied the other around her own waist. The rope was long enough, and strong enough, and the far four gargoyles perched beside hers would prove enough space to run. Touch this rope and I'll gut you, she warned the mercenary and readied herself. Knox shouted at Grave, and she dared to look to where the thief dangled. There was a sharp sound, snap of rope breaking, and Knox's cry of fear and rage, and Selena took off, sprinting across the backs of the four gargoyles before she launched herself into the void. And that was chapter 21. That was an intense one. Since it was so intense, we're just going to jump right into 22. Chapter 22. Wind tore at her, but Selena kept her focus on Knox, falling so fast, so far from her outstretched hands. People shouted below, and the light bouncing off the glass castle blinded her. But there he was, just a hand's breadth from her fingers, his gray eyes wide, his arms swinging as if he could turn them into wings. In a heartbeat, her arms were around his middle, and she slammed into him so hard that the breath was knocked from her chest. Together they plummeted, like a stone, down, 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 toward the rising ground. Knox grabbed the rope, but even that wasn't enough to lighten the bl blinding impact on her torso as the rope went taut. She held on to him with every ounce of strength she had, willing her arms not to let him go. The rope sent them careening toward the wall. Selena hardly had a sense to lean her head away from the approaching stones, and the impact burst through her side and shoulder. She held tight to him, still, focusing on her arms, on her too shallow breathing. They hung there, flat against the wall, panting as they looked at the ground thirty feet below. The rope held. Lillian, Knox said, gasping for breath. He pressed his face onto her hair. Gods above! But cheers erupted from below and drowned out his words. Selena's limbs trembled so violently that she had to focus on gripping Knox, and her stomach turned over and over and over. But they were still in the middle of the test, still expected to complete it, and Selena looked up. All the champions had stopped to see her, save the falling thief, except all except one, who perched high, high above them. Selena could only gape as the flag was ripped down and Cain howled his triumph. More cheers rose up to meet them as Cain waved the flag for everyone to see. She seethed. She would have won if he, she'd taken the easy route. She would have gotten there in half the time it took Cain. But Kale told her to stay in the middle anyway, and her path had been far more impressive and demonstrative of her skills. Cain just had to jump and swing, amateur scaling. Besides, if she had won, if she'd gone the easy way, she wouldn't have saved Knox. She clenched her jaw. Could she get back up there in time? Perhaps Knox could take the rope, and she'd just scale the wall with her bare hands. There was nothing worse than second place. But even as she thought it, Varen, Grave, Paler, and Renault climbed the last few feet to the spot, tapping with a hand before descending. Lillian, Knox, hurry up, Thrilla called, and she peered down at the weapon's master. Selena scowled and started sliding her feet along the cracks in the stone, looking for a foothold. Her skin, raw and bleeding in spots, stung as she found a crevice for her toes to squeeze into. Carefully, carefully, she pulled herself up. I'm sorry, Knox breathed his legs knocking into hers as he also sought to a foothold. It's fine, she told him, shaking, numb. Selena climbed back up the wall, leaving Knox to figure out the way on his own. Foolish. It had been so foolish to save him. What had she been thinking? Cheer up, Kaol said, drinking from his glass of water. 18th place is fine. At least Knox placed behind you. Selena said nothing and pushed her carrots around on her plate. It had taken two baths and an entire bar of soap to get the tar off her aching hands and feet, and Philippa had spent 30 minutes cleaning out and binding the wounds on each. And though Selena had stopped shaking, she could still hear the shriek and thump of Ned Clement hitting the ground. They'd carried his body away before she finished the test, only as death had saved Knox from elimination. Grave hadn't been even been scolded. There had been no rules against playing dirty. You're doing exactly like we planned, Kale went on. Though, I'd hardly consider your valiant rescue to be entirely discreet. She glared at him. Well, I still lost. 
While Dorian had congratulated her for saving Knox, and while the thief had hugged and thanked her again and again, only Kale had frowned when the test was over. Apparently, daring rescues weren't part of a jewel thief's repertoire. Kale's brown eyes shone in the mid shone golden in the midday sun. Wasn't learning to lose gracefully part of your training? No, she said sourly. Arabin told me that second place was just a nice title for first loser. Arabin Hamlet? Kale asked, setting down his glass. The king of the assassins? She looked toward the window in the glittering expanse of Rifthold, barely visible beyond it. It was strange to think that Arabin was in the same city, that he was so close to her now. You know he was my master, don't you? I'd forgotten, Kale said. Arabin would have flogged her for saving Knox, jeopardizing her own safety and place in this competition. He oversaw your training personally? He trained me himself, and then brought in tutors from all over Aurelia. The fighting masters from the rice fields of the southern continent, poison experts from the bo bo Bogdano jungle. Once he sent me to the silent assassins in the Red Desert. No price was too high for him. Or me, she added, fingering the fine thread on her bathrobe. He didn't bother to tell me until I was 14 that I was expected to pay him back for all of it. He trained you and then made you pay for it? She shrugged, but was unable to hide the flash of anger. Courtesans go through the same experience. They're taken in at a young age and are bound to their brothels until they can earn back every coin that went into their training, upkeep, and wardrobe. That's despicable, he spat, and she blinked at the anger in his voice. Anger that, for once, was not directed at her. Did you pay it back? A cold smile that didn't reach her eyes spread across her face. Oh, down to the last copper. And he then went out and spent all of it. Over 500,000 gold coins. Gone in three hours. Kale started from a seat. She shoved the memory down so deep that it stopped hurting. You still haven't apologized, she said, changing the subject before Kale could inquire further. Apologized? For what? For all the horrid things you said at yesterday afternoon when I was sparring with Nehemia. He narrowed his eyes, taking the bait. I won't apologize for speaking the truth. The truth? You treated me like I'm a crazed criminal. And you said that you hated me more deeply than anyone alive. I meant every word of it. However, a smile began to tug at her lips, and she soon found it reflected on his face. He tossed a piece of bread at her, which she caught in one hand and threw it back at him. He caught it with ease. Idiot, she said, grinning now. Crazed criminal, he returned, grinning too. I really do hate you. At least I didn't come in 18th place, he said. Slana felt her nostrils flare, and it was all Kale could do to duck the apple she chucked at his head. It wasn't until later that Philippa brought the news. The champion who hadn't shown up for the test had been found dead in a servant's stairwell, brutally mauled but dismembered. The new murder cast a pall over the next two weeks, and the two tests they brought with them. Selena passed the tests, stealth and tracking, without drawing much attention to herself or risking her neck to save anyone. No other champions were murdered, thankfully, but Selena still found herself looking over her shoulder constantly, even though Chaos seemed to consider the two murders to be just unfortunate incident incidents. Every day she got better at running, going farther and faster, and managed to keep from killing Cain when he taunted her at training. The crown prince didn't bother to show his face in her rooms again, and she only saw him during the tests, when he usually just grinned and winked at her and made her feel ridiculously tingly and warm. But she had more important things to worry about. There were only nine weeks left until the final duel, and some of the others, including Knox, were doing well enough that those four spots were starting to seem rather precious. Kane would definitely be there, but who would the other final three be? She'd always been so sure she'd make it. But if she were honest with herself, Selena wasn't so sure anymore. <sighs> and that was chapter 22. Also, hi Ari. Why in the world did you punch somebody in the face at school today? Why? Why is that necessary? Also, thank you for the hydrate. We are not supposed to be fighting at school. Oh, 
Oh, goodness, this book is getting so intense. It's getting to the good part that I'm so excited. Oh. Also, I think we're like halfway with the book. Hold on. How many pages did I say there were? Um, 404, and we're at 161. She was pointing out my insecurity, and I was angry. Ari, I understand that somebody pointing out your insecurities and being ang and making you angry is hard to deal with. But you shouldn't hit somebody. That's not the solution to stop somebody being from being mean. I I know that being mean isn't nice. It's mean is the opposite of nice in definition. But you should not punch people for it. You should find a different way to handle it, whether it's just ignoring them because they're just trying to get a rise and reaction out of you, or telling somebody of authority that they're being mean. Punching them is not the answer. That is that is a good response. Listen listen to Lamamda. Listen to Lamamda. Mean people are only mean because they're more insecure than you are. I understand it's hard to to keep in that urge, but we must try every day. If everybody went around punching people who they didn't like, uh, the world would be full of black eyes. <laughs> let's uh let it let's continue into chapter twenty-three. Selena gaped at the ground. She knew these sharp gray rocks, knew how they crunched beneath her feet, how they smelled after the rain, how they could so easily cut into her skin when she was thrown down. The rocks stretched for miles, rising into jagged, fang-like mountains that pierced the cloudy sky. In the frigid wind, she had little clothing to protect her from its stinging gusts. As she touched the dirty rags, her stomach rose in her throat. What had happened? She pivoted. Shackles clanking, and took in the desolate waste that was in Dovier. She had failed, failed, and had been sent back here. There was no chance of escape. She had tasted freedom, come so close to it, and now? Selena screamed as excruciating pain shut down her back, barely heralded by the crack of the whip. She fell onto the ground, stone slicing into her raw knees. Get on your feet, someone barked. Tears stung her eyes, and the whip creaked as it rose again. She would be killed this time. She would die from the pain of it. The whip fell, slicing into bone, reverberating through her body, making everything collapse and explode in agony, shifting her body into a graveyard. A dead... Selena's eyes flew open. She panted. Are you? Someone said beside her, and she jerked. Where was she? It was a dream, said Kao. She stared at him, then looked around the room, running a hand through her hair. Rifthold. Rifthold, that's where she was. In the glass castle. No, in the stone castle beneath. She was sweating, and the sweat on her back felt uncomfortably like blood. She felt dizzy, nauseated, too small and too large all at once. Though her windows were shut, an odd draft from somewhere in her room kissed her face, smelling strangely of roses. Selena, it was a dream, the captain of the guard said again. You were screaming, he gave her a shaky smile. I thought you were being murdered. Selena reached around to touch her back beneath her nightshirt. She could feel the three ridges, and some smaller ones, but nothing, nothing. I was being whipped. She shook her head to remove the memory from her mind. What are you doing here? It's not even dawn. She crossed her arms, flushing slightly. It's Sam Hewen. I'm canceling our training today, but I wanted to see if you planned to attend the service. Today's what? It's Sam Hewen today? Why has no one mentioned that it? Is there a feast tonight? Could she have become so en enmeshed in the competition that she'd lost track of time? He frowned. Of course, but you're not invited. Of course, and will you be summoning the dead to you this haunted night, or lighting a bonfire with your companions? I don't partake in such superstitious nonsense. Be careful, my cynical friend, she warned, putting a hand in the air. The gods and the dead are closer to Earth on this day. They can hear every nasty comment you make. He rolled his eyes. It's a silly holiday to celebrate the coming of winter. The bonfires just produce ash to cover the fields. As an offering to the gods to keep them safe. As a way to fertilize them. Helena pushed back the covers. So says you, 
she said as she stood. She adjusted her drenched nightgown. She reeked of sweat. He snorted, following after her as, he, as she walked. I never took you for a superstitious person. How does that fit into your career? She glared at him over her shoulder before she strode into the bathing chamber. Kaol close behind. She paused on the threshold. Are you going to join me? She said, and Kaol stiffened, realizing his error. He slammed the door in response. Selena found him waiting in her dining room when she emerged, her hair dripping water onto the floor. Don't you have your own breakfast? You still haven't given me an answer. An answer to what? She sat down across the table and spooned porridge into her bowl. All that was needed was a heap, no, three heaps of sugar and some hot cream and... Are you going to temple? I am allowed to go to temple, but not the feast? She took a spoonful of porridge. Religious observances shouldn't be denied to anyone. And the feast is a show of debauchery. Ah, I see. She swallowed another bite. Oh, she loved porridge. But perhaps I need another spoonful of sugar. Well, are you going? We need to leave soon if you are. No, she said through her food. For someone so super superstitious, you risk angering the gods by not attending. I imagine that as that an assassin would take more interest in the Day of the Dead. She made a demented face as she continued eating. I worship in my own way. Perhaps I'll make a sacrifice or two of my own. He rose, patting his sword. Mind yourself while I'm gone. Don't bother dressing too elaborately. Brulo told me that you're still training this afternoon. You've got a test tomorrow. Again? Didn't we just have one three days ago? She moaned. The last test had been javelin throwing on horseback, and a spot on her wrist was still tender. But he said nothing more, and her chambers turned silent. Though she tried to forget it, the sound of the whip still snapped in her ears. Grateful the service was finally over, Dorian Havilliard strode by himself through the castle grounds. Religion neither convinced nor moved him, and after hours of sitting in a pew, muttering prayer after prayer, he was in desperate need of some fresh air, and solitude. He sighed through his clenched teeth, rubbing a spot on his temple, and head to the garden. He passed a cluster of ladies, each of whom curtsied and giggled behind their fans. Dorian gave them a terse nod as he strode by. His mother had used the ceremony as a chance to point out all the eligible ladies to him. He'd spent the entire service trying not to scream at the top of his lungs. Dorian turned around a hedge, almost crashing into a figure of blue-green velvet. It was the color of a mountain lake, that gem-like shade that didn't quite have a name. Not to mention the dress was about a hundred years out of fashion. His gaze rose to her face, and he smiled. Hello, Lady Lillian, he said, bowing, and then turned to her two companions. Princess Nehemia, Captain Westfall. Dorian eyed the assassin's dress again, the folds of fabric, like the flowing waters of a river, were rather attractive. You're looking festive, Selena's brows lowered. The Lady Lillian's servants were attending the service when she dressed, said Kale. There was nothing else to wear. Of course, corsets required assistance to get in and out of, and the dresses were a labyrinth of secret clasps and ties. My apologies, my lord prince, Selena said. Her eyes were bright and angry, and a blush now rose to her cheek. I'm truly sorry that my clothes don't suit your taste. No, no, he said quickly, glancing at her feet. They were clad in red shoes, red like the winter berries beginning to pop out of the bushes. You look very nice, just a bit out of place. Centuries, actually. She gave him an exasperated look. She, he turned to Nehemia. Forgive me, he said in his best LV, which wasn't very impressive at all. How are you? Her eyes shone with amusement at his shoddy elwi, but she nodded in acknowledgement. I am well, your highness, she answered in his language. Dorian's attention flicked to her two guards, who lurked in the shadows nearby, waiting, watching. Dorian's blood thrummed in his veins. For weeks now, Duke Parrington had been pushing for a plan to bring more forces into Iowa to crush the rebels so efficiently that they wouldn't dare challenge Adderland's rule again. Just yesterday, the Duke presented a plan. They would deploy more legions and keep Nehemia here to discourage any retaliation from the rebels. Not particularly inclined to add hostage taking into his repertoire of abilities, Dorian had spent hours arguing against it. But while some of the council members had also voiced their disapproval, the majority seemed to think the, Duke, the Duke's strategy to be a sound one. 
Still, Dorian had convinced them to back off about it until his father returned. That would give him time to win over some of the Duke's supporters. Now, standing before her, Dorian quickly looked away from the princess. If he were anyone but the crown prince, he would warn her. But if Nehemia left before she was supposed to, the Duke would know who had told her and inform his father. Things were bad enough between Dorian and the king. He didn't need to be branded as a rebel sympathizer. Are you going to the feast tonight? Dorian asked the princess, forcing himself to look at her and keep his features neutral. Nehemia looked to Selena. Are you attending? Selena gave her a smile and only meant that only meant trouble. Unfortunately, I have other plans. Isn't that right, your highness? She didn't bother to hide the undercurrent of, an, undercurrent of annoyance. Hale coughed, suddenly very interested in the berries and the hedges. Dorian was on his own. Don't blame me, Dorian said smoothly. You accepted an invitation to that party and were told weeks ago. Her eyes flickered, but Dorian wouldn't yield. He couldn't bring her to the feast, not with so many watching. There would be too many questions, not to mention too many people. Keeping track of her would be difficult. Nehemia frowned at Selena. So you're not going? No, but I'm sure you'll have a lovely time, Selena said, then switched into Eowe and said something else. Dorian's Eowe was just competent enough that he understood the gist of it to be. His Highness certainly knows how to keep women entertained. Nehemia laughed and Dorian's face warmed. They made a formidable pair. God's helped them all. Well, we're very important and very busy, Selena said to him, linking elbows with the princess. Perhaps allowing them to be friends was a horrible, dangerous idea. So we must be off. Good day to you, your highness, she curtsied, the red and blue gems in her belts sparkling in the sun. She looked over her shoulder, giving Dorian a sneer as she led the princess deeper into the garden. Dorian glared at Kale. Thanks for your help. The captain clapped him on the shoulder. You think that was bad? You should see them then when they really get going. With that, he strode after the women. Dorian wanted to yell, to pull out his hair. He'd enjoyed seeing Selena the other night, enjoyed it immensely. But for the past few weeks, he'd gotten caught up in council meetings and holding court, and hadn't been able to visit her. Were it not for the feast, he'd go to her again. But ha he hadn't meant to annoy her with the talk about the dress, though it was outdated. Nor had he known she'd be that irritated about not being invited to the feast, but Dorian scowled and walked off to the kennels. Selena smiled to herself, running a finger across a neatly trimmed hedge. She thought the dress was lovely. Festive, indeed. No, no, your highness, Kale was saying to Nehemia, slow enough that she could understand. I'm not a soldier. I'm a guard. There is no difference, the princess retorted, her th accent thick and a bit unwieldy. Still, Kale understood enough to bristle, and Selena could hardly contain her glee. She'd managed to see Nehemia a fair amount over the past two weeks, mostly just for brief walks and dinners, where they discussed what it was like for Nehemia to grow up in Iowa, what she thought of Rifthold, and who at court had managed to annoy the princess that day, which, to Selena's delight, was usually everyone. I'm not trained to fight in battles, Kale replied through his teeth. You kill on the orders of your king. Your king. Nehemia might not be fully versed in their language, but she was smart enough to know the power of saying those two words. Your king, not hers. <coughs> Whew, sorry about that. While Selena could listen to Nehemia rant about the king of Adderland for hours, they were in a garden. Other people might be listening. A shudder went through Selena, and she interrupted before Nehemia could say more. I think it's useless arguing with her, Kale, Selena said, nudging the captain of the guard with her elbow. Perhaps you shouldn't have given Taryn your title. Can you reclaim it? It'd prevent a lot of confusion. How'd you remember my brother's name? She shrugged, not quite understanding the gleam in his eye. You told me. Why wouldn't I remember it? He looked handsome today. It was in the way his hair met his golden skin, in the tiny gaps between the strands, in the way it fell across his brow. I suppose you'll enjoy the feast without me there, that is, she said morosely. He snorted. Are you that upset about missing it? No, she said, sweeping her unbound hair over her shoulder. But, well, it's a party, and everyone loves parties. Shall I, drink, br shall I bring you a trinket from the revelry? Only it if it consists of a sizable portion of roast lamb. The air was bright and clear around them. 
The feast isn't that exciting, he offered. It's the same as any supper. I can assure you the lamb will be dry and tough. As my friend, you should either bring me along or keep me company. Friend, he asked. She blushed. Blushed. Well, scowling escort is a better description, or reluctant acquaintance, if you prefer. To her surprise, he smiled. The princess grabbed Selena's head and hand. You'll teach me, she said in Iwe. Teach me to better speak your language, and teach me how to write and read it better than I do now, so I don't have to suffer through those horribly boring old men they call tutors. I, Selena began in the common tongue and winced. She felt guilty for leaving Nehemia out of the conversation for so long, and having the princess be fluent in both languages would be great fun. But convincing Kale to let her see Nehemia was always a hassle, because he insisted on being there to keep watch. He'd never agree to sitting through lessons. I don't know how properly to teach you my language, Selena lied. Nonsense, Nehemia said. You'll teach me, after whatever it is you do with this one for an hour every day before supper. Nehemia raised her chin in a way that suggested saying no wasn't an option. Selena swallowed and did her best to look pleasant as she turned to Kale, who observed them with raised brows. She wishes me to tutor her every day before supper. I'm afraid that's not possible, he said, she translated. Nehemia gave him the withering glare that usually made people start sweating. Why not? She fell into Iloe. She's smarter than most of the people in this castle. Kale, thankfully, caught the general gist of it. I don't think that- Am I not princess of Ilwe? Nehemia inter interrupted in the common tongue. Your highness, Kale began, but Selena silenced him with a wave of her hand. They were approaching the clock tower, black and menacing as always, but kneeling before it was Cain. His head bent, he focused on something on the ground. At the sound of their footsteps, Cain's head shot up. He grinned broadly and stood. His hands were covered in dirt. Before Selena could better observe him or his strange behavior, he nodded to Kaol and stalked away behind the tower. Nasty brute, Selena breathed, still staring in the direction in which he disappeared. Who is he? Nehemia asked in Iowe. A soldier in the king's army, Selena said, though he now serves Duke Parrington. Nehemia looked after Kane, and her dark eyes narrowed. Something about him makes me want to beat his face in. Selena laughed. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Kale said nothing as he began walking again. She and Nehemia took up behind him, and they crossed the small patio in which the clock tower stood. Selena looked at the spot where Cain had just been kneeling. He dug out the dirt packed into the hollows of the strange mark in the flagstone, making the mark clearer. What do you think this is? she asked the princess, pointing at the mark etched into the tile. And why had Cain been cleaning it? A word mark, the princess replied, giving it a name in Selena's own language. Selena's brows rose. It was just a triangle inside of a circle. Can you read these marks, she asked? A word mark? How strange. No, Nehemia said quickly. They're part of an ancient religion that died long ago. What religion? Selena asked. Look, there's another. She pointed at another mark a few feet away. It was a vertical line with an inverted peak stretching upward from its middle. You should leave it alone, Nehemia said sharply, and Selena blinked. Such things were forgotten for a reason. What are you talking about? asked Kale, and she explained the gist of their conversation. When she finished, he curled his lips but said nothing. They continued on, and Selena saw another mark. It was a strange shape, a small diamond with two inverted points protruding from either side. The top and bottom peaks of the diamond were elongated into a straight line, and it seemed to be symmetrically perfect. Had the king had them carved when he built the clock tower, or did they predate it? Nehemia was staring at her forehead, and Selena asked, Is there dirt on my face? No, Nehemia said a bit distantly, her brows nodding as she studied Selena's brow. The princess suddenly stared into Selena's eyes with a ferocity that made the assassin recoil slightly. You know nothing about the word marks? The clock tower chimed. No, Selena said, I don't know anything about them. You're hiding something, the princess said softly in Iowe, though it was not accusatory. You are much more than you seem, Lillian. I, well, I should hope I'm more than just some simpering courtier, she said with as much bravado as she could muster. She grinned broadly, hoping Nehemia would stop looking so strange and stop staring at her brow. Can you teach me how to speak Iowe properly? If you can teach me more of your ridiculous language, said the princess, 
though some caution still lingered in her eyes. What had Nehemia seen that caused her to act that way? It's a deal, Selena said with a weak smile. Just don't tell him. Captain Westfall leaves me alone in the mid-afternoon. The hour before supper is perfect. Then I shall come tomorrow at five, Nehemia said. The princess smiled and began to walk once more, a spark appearing in her black eyes. Selena could only follow after her. And that is chapter 23. Also, hi, Shork. And good night. <laughs> As they are no longer here. Sad I missed them. <sighs> oh. I need to take a quick stretchy break and figure out why my phone's blowing up because I forgot to turn it on silent. Oh, my back is killing me. Okay, it was nothing of importance, it seems. So we're all good. Oh, I need to do a quick, quick, quick back stretch. <sighs> stretch. Okay. Gosh. Let's get in to chapter 24. <clears throat> Selena lay on the bed, staring at a pool of moonlight on the floor. It filled in the dusty gaps between the stone tiles and turned everything a bluish silver that made her feel as if she were frozen in an everlasting moment. She didn't fear the night, though she found little comfort in its dark hours. It was just the time when she slept, the time when she stalked and killed, the time when the stars emerged with glittering beauty and made her feel wonderfully small and insignificant. Selena frowned. It was only midnight, and even though they had another test tomorrow, she couldn't sleep. Her eyes were too heavy to read. She wouldn't play the pianoforte for fear of another embarrassing encounter. And she most certainly wouldn't amuse herself with fantasies of what the feast was like. She was still wearing her emerald blue gown, too lazy to change. She traced the moonlight to where it lapped upon the tapestry covered the wall. The tapestry was odd, old, and not very carefully preserved. Images of forest animals amongst trooping trees dotted the large expanse. A woman, the only human in the tapestry, stood near the floor. She was life-size and remarkably beautiful. Though she had silver hair, her face was young, and her flowing white gown seemed to move in the moonlight. It... Selena sat up in bed. Tap... Did the tapestry sway slightly? She glanced at the window. It was firmly shut. The tapestry was barely blowing outward, not to the side. Could it be? Her skin tingled, and she lit a candle before approaching the wall. The tapestry stopped moving. She reached to the end of the fabric and pulled it up. There was only stone, but Selena pushed back the heavy folds of the work and tucked it behind a chest to keep it aloft. A vertical groove ran down the face of the wall, different from the rest, and then another one, not three feet from it. They emerged from the floor, and just above Selena's head, they met in a- It's a door! Selena leaned her shoulder into a slab of stone. It gave a little, and her heart jumped. She pushed again, the candle flickering in her hand. The door groaned as it moved slightly. Grunting, she shoved, and finally, it swung open. A dark passage loomed before her. A breeze blew into the black depths, pulling the strains of her hair past her face. A shiver ran down her spine. Why was the wind going inward, especially when it had blown the tapestry out? She looked back at the bed, which was littered with books she wasn't going to read tonight. She took a step into the passage. The light of the candle revealed that it was made of stone and thickly coated in dust. She stepped back into her room. If she were to go exploring, she'd need proper provisions. It was a pity she didn't have a sword or dagger. 
Selena could put her candle down. She also needed a torch, or at least some extra candlesticks. While she might be used to darkness, she wasn't foolish enough to trust it. Moving through her rooms, trembling with excitement, Selena gathered two balls of yarn from Philippa's sewing basket, along with three sticks of chalk and one of her makeshift knives. She tucked three extra candlesticks into the pockets of her cape, which she wrapped her tightly around herself. Again, she stood before the dark passage. It was terribly dark and seemed to be beckoning to her. The breeze blew into the passage again. Selena pushed a chair into the doorway. It wouldn't do to have it slam shut on her and leave her trapped forever. She tied a string to the back of the chair, nodding it five times, and held the ball in her spare hand. If she got lost, this would lead her back. She carefully folded the tapestry over the door, just in case someone came in. Striding into the passage, she found it to be cold but dry. Cobwebs hung everywhere, and there were no windows, only a very long stair that descended far beyond the light of her lit candle. She tensed as she stepped down, waiting for a single sound that would send her springing back to her rooms. It was silent. Silent and dead and completely forgotten. Selena held the candle aloft, her cape trailing behind her, leaving a clean wake on the dust-covered stairs. Minutes passed and she scanned the walls for any engravings or markings, but saw none. Was this just a forgotten servant's passage? She found herself a bit disappointed. The bottom of the stairs soon appeared, and she came to a halt before three equally dark and imposing portals. Where was she? She had difficulty imagining that such a space could be forgotten in a castle filled with so many people, but... The ground was covered with dust, not even a hint of a footprint. Knowing how the story always went, Selena lifted the candle to the arches above the portals, looking for any inscriptions regarding the sure death that would meet her if she walked beneath a specific arch. She took stock of the ball of yarn in her hand. Nat was little more than a lump of string. She set down her candle and tied another ball to the end of the string. Perhaps she would have taken another. Well, at least she still had the chalk. She chose the door in the middle, if only because it was closer. On the other side, the staircase continued downward. In fact, it went so far down that she wondered if she were beneath the castle. The passage became very damp and very cold, and Selena's candle sputtered in the moisture. There were many archways now, but Selena chose to go straight, following the moisture that grew by the inch. Water trickled down the walls, and the stone became slick with whatever fungus had grown over the centuries. Her red velvet shoes felt flimsy and thin against the wetness of the chamber. She would have considered turning back were it not for the sound that arose. It was running water, slow moving. In fact, as she walked, the passage became lighter. It was not the light of a candle, but rather the smooth white light of the outdoors, of the moon. Her yarn ran out, and she left it on the ground. There were no more turns to mark. She knew what this was. Rather, she didn't dare to hope that it was actually what she believed it to be. She hurried along, slipping twice, her heart pounding so loudly that she thought her ears would break. An archway appeared, and beyond it, beyond it, Selena stared at the sewer that ran past, flowing straight out of the castle. It smelled unpleasant, to say the least. She stood along the side, examining the open gate that led to a wide stream that undoubtedly emptied into the sea of the, or the Avery. There were no guards and no locks, save for the iron fence that hovered over the surface, raised just enough to allow trash to pass through. Four little boats were tied to either bank, and there were several other doors, some wooden, some iron, that led to this exit. It was probably an escape route for the king, though from the half-rotted condition of some of the boats, she wondered if he knew that it was here. She strode to the iron fence, putting her hand through one of the gaps. The night air was chilled, but not freezing. Trees loomed just beyond the stream. She must be in the back of the castle, the side that faced the sea. Were there any guards posted outside? She found a stone on the ground, a bit of falling ceiling, and hurled it into the water beyond the gate. There was no sound of shifting armor, no muttering or cursing. She studied the other side. There was a lever to raise the gate for the boats. Selena set down her candle, removed her cloak, and emptied her pockets. Holding tightly with her hands, she placed one foot on the gate, than the other. It would be so easy to raise the gate. She felt reckless, reckless and wild. Was What was she doing in this in a palace? Why was she, Adderland's assassin, participating in some absurd competition to prove that she was the best? She was the best. They were undoubtedly drunk now, all of them. She could take one of the less ancient boasts and disappear into the night. 
Selena began to climb back over. She needed her cloak. Oh, they were fools for thinking that they could tame her. Her foot slipped on a slick rung, and Selena barely stifled her cry as she gripped the bars, cursing as her knee banged into the gate. Clinging to the gate, she closed her eyes. It was only water. She calmed her heart, letting her feet find their support again. The moon was almost blinding, so bright the stars were barely visible. She knew that she could easily escape, and that it would be foolish to do so. The king would find her somehow, and Kael would be disgraced and relieved of his position, and Princess Nehemi would be left alone with moronic company, and, well... Selena straightened, her chin rising. She would not run from them as a common criminal. She would face them, face the king, and earn her freedom the honorable way. And why not take advantage of the free food and training for a while longer? Not to mention, she'd need to stock up on provisions for her escape, and that could take weeks. Why rush any of it? Selena returned to her start, to her starting side and picked up the cloak she, she'd win. After she won, if she ever wanted to escape her servitude to the king, well, now she had a way out. Still, Selena had difficulty leaving the chamber. She was grateful for the silence of the passes she walked upward, her legs burning from so many stairs. It was the right thing to do. Selena soon found herself before the other two portals. What other disappointments would she find in them? She had lost interest, but the breeze stirred again and it blew so hard towards the far right arch that Selena took a step. The hair in her arms rose as she watched the flame of her candle bend forward, pointing to a darkness that seemed blacker than all the rest. Whispers lay beneath the breeze, speaking to her in foreign languages. She shuddered and decided to go in the opposite direction, to take the far left portal. Following whispers on Samhoon can only lead to trouble. Despite the breeze, the passage was warm. With each step up the winding stairs, the whispers faded away. Up and up and up, her heavy breathing and shuffling steps the only sound. There were no twisting passages once she reached the top, but rather one straight hall that seemed to lead on forever. She followed it, her feet already tired. After some time, she was surprised to hear music. Actually, it was the sound of great revelry, and there was golden light ahead. It streamed in through a door or a window. She rounded the corner and ascended a small set of steps that led into a significantly smaller hallway. In fact, the ceiling was so low that she had to duck as she waddled toward the light. It wasn't a door, nor a window, but rather a bronze gate. Selena blinked at the light as she looked, from high above, at the feast in the Great Hall. Were these tunnels for spying? She frowned at what she saw. Over a hundred people eating, singing, dancing. There was Kaol sitting beside some old man, talking and... Laughing? His happiness made her own face flush in response, and Selena set down her candle. She peered at the other end of the massive hall. There were a few other grates just below the ceiling, though she couldn't see no other squinting eyes beyond their ornate metalwork. Selena shifted her gaze to the dancers. Among them were a few of the champions, dressed finely, but not finely enough to conceal their poor dancing. Knox, who had now become her sparring and training partner, danced as well, perhaps a bit more elegantly than the others, though she still pitied the ladies who danced with him, but the other champions were allowed to attend and she wasn't? She gripped the gate, pressing her face against it to get a better look. Sure enough, there were more champions seated at the tables. Even the pimply-faced Paler sat near Kale, a half-rate boy assassin. She bared her teeth. How dare she be denied an invitation to the feast? The tightness in her chest abated only slightly when she couldn't find Cain's face among the revelers. revelers. At least they kept him locked up in a cage, too. She spotted the crown prince, dancing and laughing with some blonde idiot. She wanted to hate him for refusing to invite her. She was his champion, after all. But she had difficulty not staring at him. She had no desire to talk to him, but rather just to look at him, to see that unusual grace and the kindness in his eyes that made her tell him about Sam. While he might be in Havilliard, he was, well, he was still very mu well, she still very much wanted to kiss him. Selena scowled as the dance finished and the crown prince kissed the hand of the blonde woman. She turned away from the grate. Here the hallway ended. She glanced back at the feast, only to see Kale stand from the table and begin weaving, weaving his way out of the great hall. What if he came to her rooms and found her missing? Hadn't he promised to bring her something from the feast? Groaning at the thought of all the stairs she now had to climb, she picked up her candle and yarn and hurried toward the comfort of higher ceilings, rolling up the string as she went. 
Down and down she ran, taking the steps two by two. She burst past the portals and darted up the stairs to her room, small light growing with each bound. Kale would throw her in the dungeons if he found her in some secret passageway, especially if the passageway led out of the castle. She was sweating when she reached her chambers. She kicked the chair away, swung the stone door shut, and pulled the tapestry over it and flung herself on the bed. After hours of enjoying himself at the feast, Dorian entered Selena's rooms, not sure what exactly he was doing in the chambers of an assassin at two in the morning. His head spun from the wine, and he was so tired from all the dancing that he was fairly certain that if he sat down, he'd fall asleep. Her chambers were silent and dark, and he cracked open her bedroom door to peer inside. Though she was asleep on the bed, she still wore that strange dress. Somehow, it seemed far more fitting now that she lay sprawled on the red blanket. Her golden hair was spread around her, and a flush of pink bloomed on her cheeks. A book lay by her side, open and still waiting for her to turn the page. He remained in the doorway, fearful that she'd wake up if he took another step. Some assassin. She hadn't even bothered to stir. But there was nothing of the assassin in her face. Not a trace of aggression or bloodlust lay across her features. He knew her somehow, and he knew she wouldn't harm him. It made little sense. When they talked, as sharp as her words usually were, he felt at ease, as if he could say anything. And she must have felt the same after she'd told him about Sam, whoever he'd been. So here he was, in the middle of the night, she flirted with him, but was it real? A footstep sounded, and he found Kale standing across the foyer. The captain stalked over to Dorian and grabbed him by the arm. Dorian knew better than to struggle as his friend dragged him through the foyer, then stopped in front of the door to the hall. What are you doing here? Kale hissed softly. What are you doing here? Dorian countered, trying to keep his voice quiet. It was the better question, too. Kale spent so much time warning him about the dangers of associating with Selena. What was he doing here in the middle of the night? And by the word, Dorian, she's an assassin. Please, please tell me you haven't been here before. Dorian couldn't help his smirk. I don't even want an explanation. Just get out, you reckless idiot. Get out. Kale grabbed him by the collar of his jacket, and Dorian might have punched his friend had Kale not been so lightning fast. Before he knew it, he was roughly tossed into the hallway, and the door closed and locked behind him. Dorian, for some reason, didn't sleep well that night. Kale Westwell took a deep breath. What was he doing here? Had he any right to treat the Crown Prince of Adderlin in such a manner, when he himself was going against reason? He didn't understand the rage that arose upon seeing Dorian standing in the doorway. Didn't want to understand that sort of anger. It wasn't jealousy, but something beyond it. Something that tra transformed his friend into someone else. Someone he didn't know. He was fairly certain she was a virgin. But Dorian didn't. But did Dorian know it? It probably made him more interested. He sighed and eased the door open, wincing as it creaked loudly. She was still in her clothes, and while she looked beautiful, that did nothing to mask the killing potential that lay beneath. It was present in her strong jaw, in the slope of her eyebrows, in the perfect stillness of her form. She was a honed blade made by the King of Assassins for his own profit. She was a sleeping animal, a mountain cat or a dragon, and her markings of power were everywhere. He shook his head and walked into the bedroom. At the sound of his step, she opened an eye. It's not morning, she grumbled and rolled over. I brought you a present. He felt immensely foolish, and for a moment considered running from her rooms. A present? she said more clearly, turning toward him and blinking. It's nothing. They were giving them out at the party. Just give me your hand. It was a lie. Sort of. They had given them to the women of the nobility as favors, and he'd snagged one from the basket as it was passed around. Most of the women would never wear them. They would be tossed aside or given to a favorite servant. Let me see it. She lazily extended an arm. He fished in his pocket and pulled out the gift. Here. He placed it in her palm. She examined it, smiling drowsily. A ring? She put it on. How pretty! It was simple, crafted of silver. Its only or ornamentation lay in the fingernail-sized amethyst embedded in its center. The surface of the gem was smooth and round, and it gleamed up at the assassin like a purple eye. Thank you, she said, her eyelids drooping. You're wearing your gown, Selena. His blush refused to fade. I'll change in a moment. He knew she wouldn't. I just need to rest. Then she was asleep, a hand upon her breast, the ring hovering over her heart. With a disgruntled sigh, the captain grabbed a blanket from the nearby sofa and tossed it over her. He was half tempted to remove the ring from her finger, but, well, there was something peaceful looking about her. Rubbing his neck, his face still burning, he walked from her rooms, 
wondering how exactly he'd explain this to Dorian tomorrow. And that was chapter 24. <laughs> Clayton, I am glad you finished your homework. And that I did not have to time you out. <laughs> See, I told you guys, this book is getting good. Getting good. Plot twists are happening. It's going down. It's getting real nice. How many pages are the next few chapters? We could we could probably get through this. It's like 30 pages. Let's hop right into chapter 25. Selena dreamt. She was walking down the long secret passage again. She didn't have a candle, nor did she have a string to lead her. She chose the portal on the right, for the other two were dank and unwelcoming. And this one seemed to be warm and pleasant. And the smell. It wasn't the smell of mildew, but of roses. The passage twisted and wound, and Selena found herself descending a narrow set of stairs. For some reason she couldn't name, she avoided brushing against the stone. The staircase swooped down, winding on and on, and she followed the rose scent whenever another door or arch appeared. Just when she grew tired of so much walking, she reached the bottom of, the set of, of a set of stairs and stopped. She stood before an old wooden door. A bronze knocker in the form of a skull hung in its center. It seemed to be smiling. She waited for that terrible breeze, or to hear someone cry, or for it to become cold and damp, but it was still warm, and it still smelled lovely, and so Selena, with a bit of mustard courage, turned the handle. Without a sound, the door swung open. She expected to find a dark, forgotten room, but this was something far different. A shaft of moonlight shot through a small hole in the ceiling, falling open falling upon the face of a beautiful marble statue lying upon a stone slab. No, not a statue. A, sarcoph a sarcophagus. It was a tomb. Trees were carved into the stone ceiling, and they stretched above the sleeping female figure. A second sarcophagus had been placed beside the woman, depicting a man. Why was the woman's face bathed in moonlight and the man's in darkness? He was handsome, his beard clipped and short, his brow broad and clear, and his nose straight and sturdy. He held a stone sword between his hands, its handle resting upon his chest. Her breath was sucked from her. A crown sat upon his head. The woman, too, wore a crown. It wasn't a tacky, enormous thing, but rather a slender peak with a blue gem embedded in the center, the only jewel in the statue. Her hair, long and wavy, spilled around her head and tumbled over the side of the lid, so lifelike that Selena could have sworn it was real. The moonlight fell upon her face and Selena's hand trembled as she reached out and touched the smooth, youthful cheek. It was cold and hard as a statue should be. Which queen were you? She said aloud, her voice reverberating through the still chamber. She ran a hand across the lips, then across the brow. Her eyes narrowed. A mark was faintly carved into the surface, practically invisible to the eye. She traced it with her finger, then traced it again. Deciding that the moonlight must be bleaching it, Selena shielded the spot with her hand. A diamond, two arrows piercing its side, then a vertical line through the middle. It was the word mark she'd seen earlier. She stepped back from the sarcophagi, suddenly cold. This was a forbidden place. She tripped on something, and as she staggered, she noticed the floor. Her mouth fell open. It was covered in stars, raised carvings that mirrored the night sky, and the ceiling depicted the earth. Why were they reversed? She looked at the walls and put a hand to her heart. Countless word marks were etched into its surface. They were in swirls and whirls and lines and squares. The small word marks made up larger ones, and the larger ones made up even larger ones, until it seemed the entire room meant something she couldn't possibly understand. Selena looked at the stone coffins. There was something written at the feet of the queen. Selena inched toward the female figure. There, in stone letters, it read, Ah! Time's rift! It made little sense. They must be important rulers and immensely old, but she approached the head again. There was something calming and familiar about the queen's face, something that reminded Selena of the rose smell. 
but there was still something off about her. Something odd. Sel Selena almost cried aloud as she saw them. The pointed, arched ears. The ears of the Fae. The immortal. But no Fae had married into the Affiliar line for a thousand years. And there had been only one, and she was a half-breed at that. If this were true, if she was Fae, or half-Fae, then she was... She was... Selena stumbled back from the woman and slammed into the wall. A coating of dust blew into the air around her. And this man was Gavin, the first king of Adderlin, and this was Elena, the first princess of Terrasin, Brandon's daughter, and Gavin's wife and queen. Selena's heart pounded so violently that she felt sick, but she couldn't make her feet move. She shouldn't have entered the tomb. She shouldn't have strayed into the sacred place of the dead when she was so stained and tainted by her crimes. Something would come after her and haunt and torture her for disturbing their peace. But why was their tomb so neglected? Why had no one been to honor the dead this day? And why were there not flowers at her head? Why was Elena Galathinia Savilliard forgotten? Against the far wall of the chamber sat piles of jewels and weapons. A sword was prominently displayed before a suit of gold and armor. She knew that sword. She stepped toward the tre treasure. It was the legendary sword of Gavin. The sword he had wielded in the fierce wars that had almost ripped apart the continent. The sword that had slain the Dark Lord, Erewhon. Even after a thousand years, it hadn't rusted. Though magic might have vanished, it seemed that the power that had forgotten, had forged the blade, lived on. Damaris, she whispered, naming the blade. You know your history, said a light female voice. And Selena jumped, yelping as she tripped over a spear and fell into a golden-filled chest. The voice laughed. Selena grappled for a dagger, a candlestick, anything. But then she saw the owner of the voice and froze. She was beautiful beyond reckoning. Her silver hair flowed around her youthful face like a river of moonlight. Her eyes were a crystal sparkling blue. And her skin was white as alabaster. And her ears were ever so slightly pointed. Who are you? The assassin breathed, knowing the answer but wanting to hear it. You know who I am, Elena Pavillier said. Her likeness had been perfectly rendered on the sarcophagus. Selena didn't move from where she had fallen to the chest, despite her throbbing spine and legs. Are you a ghost? Not quite, said Queen Elena, helping Selena rise from her chest. Her hand was cold but solid. I'm not alive, but my spirit doesn't haunt this place. She flicked her eyes toward the ceiling, and her face became grave. I've risked much coming here tonight. Selena, despite herself, took a step away. Risked? I cannot stay here long, and neither can you, said the queen. What sort of absurd dream was this? They are distracted for now, but... Elena Havilliard looked at her husband's sarcophagus. Selena's head ached. Was Gavin Havilliard distracting something above? Who needs distracting? The eight guardians. You know of whom I speak. Selena stared at her blankly, but then understood. The gargoyles on the clock tower. The queen nodded. They guard the portal between our worlds. We have managed to buy some time, and I was able to slip past. She grasped Selena's arms. To her surprise, it hurt. You must listen to what I tell you. Nothing is a coincidence. Everything has a purpose. You were meant to come to this castle just as you were meant to be an assassin, to learn the skills necessary for survival. The nausea returned. She hoped Elena wouldn't speak of what her heart refused to remember. Hoped that the queen wouldn't mention what she had spent so long forgetting. Something evil dwells in this castle, something wicked enough to make the stars quake. Its malice echoes into all worlds. The queen went on. You must stop it. Forget your friendships. Forget your debts and oaths. Destroy it before it's too late. Before a portal is ripped open so wide that there can be no undoing it. Her head whipped around as if she heard something. Oh, there is no time, she said, the whites of her eyes showing. You must win this competition and become the king's champion. You understand the people's plight. Aurelia needs you as the king's champion. But what is... The queen reached into her pockets. They must not catch you here. If they do, all will be lost. Wear this. She pushed something cold and metallic into Selena's hands. It will protect you from harm. She yanked Selena into the door. You were led here tonight, but not by me. I was led here too. Someone wants you to learn. Someone wants you to see. Her head snapped to the side as a growl ripped through the air. They are coming, she whispered. But I don't understand. I'm not I'm not who you think I am. Queen Elena put her hands on Selena's shoulder and kissed her forehead. Courage of the heart is very rare, she said with sudden calm. Let it guide you. A distinct howl shook the walls and made Selena's blood icy. Go, said the queen, shoving Selena into the hallway. Run! 
Needing no more encouragement, Selena staggered up the stairs. She fled so fast they had shit that she had little idea of where she was going. There was a scream below and snarling, and Selena's stomach rose in her throat as she hurled herself upward. The light of her chambers appeared, and as it neared, she heard a faint voice cry from behind her, almost in sudden realization and anger. Selena hurtled into the room and saw only her bed before everything went dark. Selena's eyes opened. She was breathing, hard, and still wearing her gown. But she was safe, safe in her room. Why was she so prone to strange, unpleasant dreams? And why was she out of breath? Find and destroy the evil lurking in the castle indeed. Selena turned on her side and would have gladly fallen asleep again were it not for the metal that cut into her palm. Please tell me this is Kale's ring. But she knew it wasn't. In her hand lay a coin-sized gold amulet on a delicate chain. She fought against the urge to scream, made of intricate bands of metal. Within the round border of the amulet lay two overlapping circles, one on top of the other. In the space that they shared was a small blue gem that gave the center of the amulet the appearance of an eye. The line ran straight through the entire thing. It was beautiful and strange and... Selena faced the tapestry. The door was slightly ajar. She jumped from the bed, slamming into the wall so hard that her shoulder made an ugly cracking noise. Despite the pain, she rushed to the door and pulled it tightly shut. Last thing she needed was for whatever was down there to wind up in her rooms, or to have Elena show up again. Panting, Selena stepped back, surveying the tapestry. The woman's figure rose up from behind the wooden chest. With a jolt, she realized it was Elena. She stood just where the door was. A clever marker. Selena threw more logs onto the fire, quickly changed into her nightgown, and slid into bed, clutching her makeshift knife. The amulet lay where she had left it. It will protect you. Selena glanced at the door again. No screams, no howls, nothing to indicate what had just happened. Still... Selena cur cursed herself for it, but hastily attached the chain around her neck. It was light and warm. Pulling the covers up to her chin, she squeezed her eyes shut, waiting for sleep to come, or for a clawed hand to snatch at her, to decapitate her. If it hadn't been a dream, if it hadn't just been some hallucination, Selena clutched the necklace. Become the king's champion. She could do that. She was going to do that anyway. But what were Elena's motives? Aurelia needed the king's champion to be someone who understood the suffering of the masses? That seems simple enough. But why did Elena have to be the one to tell her that? And how did it tie to her first command, to find and destroy the evil lurking in the castle? Selena took a steadying breath, nestling farther into her pillows. What a fool she was for opening the secret door on Samhuin. Had she somehow brought all of this upon herself then? She opened her eyes, watching the tapestry. Something evil dwells in this castle destroy it. Didn't she have enough to worry about right now? She was going to fulfill Elena's second command, but the first, that might lead her into trouble. It wasn't like she could go poking about the castle whenever and wherever she pleased, either. But if there was a threat like that, then not only her life was at risk. And while she'd been more than happy to if some dark force somehow destroyed Kane, Parrington, and the King, and Caltain Rampier, if Nehemia or even Kale and Dorian were somehow harmed, Selena took a shuddering breath. The least she could do was look in the tomb for some clues. Maybe she'd find out something regarding Elena's purpose. And if that didn't yield anything, well, at least she tried. The phantom breeze flowed through her room, smelling of roses. It was a long while before Selena slipped into an uneasy sleep. And that was chapter 25. I know, I know, it's good, some good shit, some good shit. Whew. Let's get into chapter 26. The doors to her bedroom banged open, and Selena was on her feet in an instant, a candlestick in hand. But Kale took no notice of her as he stormed in, his jaw clenched. She groaned and slumped back onto her bed. Don't you ever sleep? She grumbled, pulling the covers over herself. Weren't you celebrating the wee hours of the morning? She put a hand on it. He put a hand on his sword as he ripped back the blankets and dragged her out of bed by the elbow. Where were you last night? She pushed away the fear that tightened her throat. There was no way he could know about the passages. She smiled at him. 
Here, of course, didn't you visit to give me this? She yanked her elbow out of his grasp and waved her fingers in front of him, displaying the amethyst ring. That was for a few minutes. What about the rest of the night? She refused to step back as he studied her face, then her hands, then the rest of her. As he did so, she returned the favor. His black tunic was unbuttoned at the top and slightly wrinkled, and his short hair needed a combing. Whatever this was, he was in a rush. What's all the fuss about? Don't we have a test this morning? She picked at her nails as she waited for an answer. It's been cancelled. A champion was found dead this morning. Xavier, the thief from Melisande. She flicked her eyes to him, then back to her nails. And I suppose you think I did it? I'm hoping you didn't, as the body was half eaten. Eaten? She crinkled her nose. She sat cross-legged on the bed, propping herself on her hands. How gruesome. Perhaps Cain did it. He's beastly enough to do such a thing. Her stomach felt tight. Another champion murdered. Did it have to do with whatever evil Elena had mentioned? The Eye Eater and the other two champions' killings hadn't been just a fluke, or a drunken brawl, as the investigation had determined. No, this was a pattern. Kale sighed through his nose. I'm glad you find humor in a man's murder. She made herself grin at him. Kane is the most likely candidate. You're from Aniel. You should know more than anyone how they are in the White Fang Mountains. He ran a hand through his short hair. You should mind who you accuse. Well, Kane is a brute, he's Duke's He's Duke Parrington's champion. And I'm the crown prince's champion. She flipped her hair over her shoulder. I should think that means I can accuse whomever I please. Just tell me plainly. Where were you last night? She straightened, staring into his golden brown eyes. As my guards can attest, I was here the entire night. Though if the king wants me questioned, I can always tell him that you can vouch for me too. Kale glanced at her ring, and she hid her smile as a faint line of color crept into his cheeks. He said, I'm sure you'll be even more pleased to hear that you and I won't be having a lesson today. She grinned at that, and slightly, and sighed dramatically as she slid back under the blankets and nestled into her pillows. Immensely pleased, she pulled the blankets up to her chin and batted her eyelashes at him. Now get out. I'm going to celebrate by sleeping for another five hours. A lie. But he bought it. She closed her eyes before she could see the glare he gave her, and smiled to herself when she heard him stalk out of the room. It was only when she heard him slam the doors to her room that she sat up. The champion had been eaten? Last night in her dream, no, it hadn't been a dream. It had been real, and there had been those screeching creatures. Had Xavier been killed by one of them? But they'd been in the tomb. There was no way they could have been in the castle halls without someone noticing. Some vermin probably got to the body before it was found. Very, very hungry vermin. She shuddered again and leapt out from under the blankets. She needed a few more makeshift weapons and a way to fortify the locks on her windows and doors. Even as she readied her defenses, she kept assuring herself that it was nothing to worry about at all. But with a few hours of freedom ahead of her, she brought as many of them with her as possible as she locked the door to her bedroom and slipped into the tomb. Selena, placed, Selena paced the length of the tomb, snarling to herself. There was nothing here to explain Elena's motives, or what the source of this mysterious evil might be. Absolutely nothing. In the daytime, a ray of sunlight shone into the tomb, making all the dust motes that she stirred up swirl like falling snow. How was it possible that there was light so far beneath the castle? Selena paused beneath the grate in the ceiling, peering up at the light flowing through it. Sure enough, the sides of the shaft shimmered. They were lined with polished gold. A lot of gold, if it meant reflecting the sun's rays all the way down here. Selena stalked between the two sarcophagi. Though she'd brought three of her makeshift weapons, she'd found no trace of whatever had been growling and screeching last night, and no trace of Elena either. Selena paused beside Elena's sarcophagus. The blue gem embedded in her stone crown pulsed in the faint sunlight. What was your purpose in telling me to do those things? She mused aloud her voice echoing off the intricately carved walls. You've been dead for a thousand years. Why still bother with Aurelia? And why not get Dorian or Kale or Nehemia or someone else to do it? Selena wrapped a finger on the queen's pert nose. One would think you'd have better things to do with your afterlife. Though she tried to grin, her voice came out quieter than she would have liked. She should go. Even with her bedroom door locked, someone was bound to come looking for her sooner or later and she highly doubted that anyone would believe her if she told him that she'd been charged with a very important mission by the first queen of Adderlin. In fact, she realized with a grimace, she'd be lucky if she were accused of treason and magic using.
it would certainly guarantee her return to Endovier. After a final sweep of the tomb, Selena left. There was nothing useful here, and besides, if Elena wanted her to be the king's champion so badly, then she couldn't spend all of her time hunting down whatever this evil was. It would probably hurt her chances of winning, actually. Selena hurried up the steps, her torch casting odd shadows on the walls. If this evil was as threatening as Elena made it seem, then how could she possibly defeat it? Not that the thought of something wicked dwelling in the castle scared her or anything. No, it wasn't that at all, Selena huffed. She focused on becoming King's she'd focus on becoming King's champion. And then if she won, she'd go about finding this evil. Maybe. An hour later, flanked by guards, Selena held her chin high as they strode through the halls toward the library. She smiled at the young chevaliers as they passed and smirked at the court women who eyed her pink and white gown. She couldn't blame them. The dress was spectacular, and she was spectacular in it. Even Russ, one of the handsome guards posted outside her rooms, had said so. Naturally, it hadn't been too difficult to convince him to escort her to the library. Selena smiled smugly to herself as she nodded to a passing nobleman, who raised his eyebrows at the sight of her. He was immensely pale. She noticed as he opened his mouth to say something, but Selena continued down the hall. Her steps quickened at the rumblings of an arguing male voices that echoed off the stones as they neared the bend. Hurrying farther, Selena ignored the click of Russ's tongue as she rounded the corner. She knew that smell all too well, the tang of blood and the stinging reek of decomposing flesh. But she hadn't expected the sight of it. Half eaten was a pleasant way to describe what was left of Xavier's frail, thin body. One of her escorts cursed under his breath and Russ stepped closer to her, a light hand on her back, encouraging her to keep walking. None of the gathered men looked at her as she, pa as she passed, skirting the edge of the scene and getting a better look at the body in the process. Xavier's chest cavity had been split open and his vital organs removed. Unless someone had moved them upon finding the body, there was no trace of them. And his long face, stripped of its flesh, was still contorted in a silent scream. This was no accidental killing. There was a hole in the crown of Xavier's head, and she could see that his brain was gone, too. The smears of blood on the wall looked like someone had been writing, and then rubbed it away. But even now, some of the writing remained, and she tried not to gape at it. Word marks. Three word marks, forming an arcing line that had to have once been a circle near the body. Holy gods, one of, the gar one of her guards muttered as they left behind the throng of the crime scene. No wonder Kale had looked so disheveled this morning, she straightened. He thought she did this? Fool, if she wanted to knock off her comp knock off her competitors one by one, she'd do it quick and clean, a slit throat, a knife in the heart, a poisoned glass of wine. This was just plain tasteless and strange. The word marks made this something more than a brutal killing. Ritualistic, perhaps. Someone approached from the opposite direction. It was Grave, the vicious assassin, staring at the body from a distance. His eyes... Dark and still like a forest pool met hers. She ignored his rotting teeth as he, she jerked her chin toward the remnant, remnants of Xavier. Too bad, she said, deliberately not sounding very sorry at all. Grave chuckled, sticking his gnarled fingers into the pockets of his worn and dirty pants. Didn't his sponsor bother to properly clothe him? Obviously not if his sponsor was nasty and foolish enough to pick him as a champion. Such a pity, Grave said, shrugging as she passed by him. She nodded tersely, and despite herself, she kept her mouth shut as she continued down the hall. There were only sixteen of them left now, sixteen champions, and four of them were to duel. The competition was getting steeper. She should thank whatever grim god had decided to end Xavier's life, but so, for some reason, she couldn't. Also, Chaz, thank you for the cat ears. I can't set the timer, I just have to look at mine. Yeah. Dorian swung his sword, grunting as Kale easily deflected the blow and parried. His muscles were sore from weeks of not practicing, and his breath was ragged in his throat as he thrust and thrust again. This is what comes from such idle behavior, Kale chuckled, stepping to the side so that Dorian stumbled forward. He remembered a time when they had been of equal skill, though that had been long ago. Dorian, while he still enjoyed his swordplay, had grown to prefer books. 
I've had meetings and important things to read, Dorian said, panting. He lunged. Kale deflected, faint, and then thrust so hard that Dorian stepped back. His temper rose. Meetings which you use an excuse to start w arguing with Duke Parrington. Dorian made a wide sweep of his sword, and Kale took up the defensive. Or maybe you're just too busy visiting Sardothian's room in the middle of the night. Sweat dripped from Kale's brow. How long has that been going on? Dorian growled as Kale switched to the offensive, and conceded step after step, his thighs aching. It's not what you think, he said through his teeth. I don't spend my nights with her. Aside from last night, I've only visited her once, and she was less than warm. Don't worry. At least one of you has some common sense. Kale delivered each blow with such precision that Dorian had to admire him. Because you've clearly lost your mind. And what about you, Dorian demanded. Do you want me to comment on how you showed up in her rooms last night? The same night another champion died? Dorian fainted, but Kale didn't fall for it. Instead, he struck strongly enough that Dorian staggered back a step, fighting to keep his footing. Dorian grimaced at the rage flickering in Kale's eyes. Fine, that was a cheap shot, he admitted, bringing his sword up to deflect another blow. But I still want an answer. Maybe I don't have one. Like you said, it's not what you think. Kale's brown eyes gleamed, but before Dorian could debate it, his friend switched the subject with brutal aim. How's court? Kale asked, breathing hard. Dorian winced. That was why he was here. If he had to spend another moment sitting in his mother's court, he'd go mad. That terrible? Shut up, Dorian snarled and slammed his sword into Kale's. It must be exceptionally awful to be you today. I bet all the ladies were begging you to protect them from the murderer inside our walls. Kale grinned, but it didn't reach his eyes. Taking the time to spar with him when there was a fresh corpse in the castle was a sacrifice Dorian was surprised Kale had been willing to make. Dorian knew how much his position meant to him. Dorian stopped suddenly and straightened. Kale should be doing more important things right now. Enough, he said, sheathing his rapier. Not missing a step, Kale did the same. They walked from the sparring room in silence. Any word from your father? Kale asked in a voice that indicated he knew something was amiss. I wonder where he went off to. Dorian let a long breath, calming his panting. No, I haven't the slightest idea. I remember him leaving like this was like this when we were children, but it hasn't happened for some years now. I bet he's doing something particularly nasty. Be careful what you say, Dorian. Or what, you'll throw me in the dungeons? He didn't mean to snap, but he'd barely gotten any sleep the night before. And this champion winding up dead did nothing to improve his mood. When Kale didn't bother retorting, Dorian asked, Do you think someone wants to kill all the champions? Perhaps. I can understand wanting to kill the com competition. But to do so viciously? I hope it's not a pattern. Dorian's blood went a bit cold. You think they'll try to kill Selena? I added some extra guards around her rooms. To protect her or to keep her in? They stopped at the hallway crossroads where they would part ways to their separate rooms. What difference does it make? Kale said quietly. You don't seem to care either way. You'll visit her no matter what I say, and the guards won't stop you because you're the prince. There was something so defeated, so bitter, underlying the captain's words that Dorian, for a heartbeat, felt badly. He should stay away from Selena. Kale had enough to worry about. But then he thought of the list of his mother made and realized he had enough too. I need to inspect Xavier's body again. I'll see you in the hall for dinner tonight, was all Kale said before he headed to his rooms. Dorian watched him go. The walk back to his tower felt surprisingly long. He opened the wooden door to his rooms, peeling off his clothing and as he headed to the bathing rooms. He had the entire tower to himself, though his chambers occupied only the upper level. They provided a haven from everyone, but today they just felt empty. And that was chapter 26. Layton, then make brogies. If you want to make brogies, make brogies. <clears throat> We're already at two hours. <laughs> oh, and we read eight chapters tonight instead of nine. How long is chapter 27? Hmm. Chapter 27 is a bit long. We had five more minutes of you. Okay. I'll read one more chapter. We'll go a little bit longer than two hours tonight. 
Oh my god, mom. <laughs> Let's hop into chapter 27. Late that afternoon, Selena stared at the ebony clock tower. It grew darker and darker as if it somehow absorbed the sun's dying rays. On top of it, the gargoyles remained stationary. They hadn't moved, not even a finger. The guardians, Elena had called them. But guardians to what? They scared Elena enough to keep her away. Surely if they'd been the evil Elena mentioned, she would have just said it outright. Not that Selena was considering looking for it right now. Not when it could get her into trouble and somehow wind up killing her before she could even become the king's champion. Still, why did Elena have to be so oblique about everything? What's your obsession with these ugly things? Nehemia asked from beside her. Selena looked to the princess. Do you think they move? They're made of stone, Lillian, the princess said in the common tongue, her elwy accent, accent slightly less thick. Oh, Selena exclaimed, smiling. That was very good. One lesson and you're already putting me to shame. Unfortunately, the same couldn't be said of Selena's Iwe. Nehemia beamed. They do look wicked, she said in an Iwe. And I'm afraid the word marks don't help, Selena said. A word mark was at her feet, and she glanced to the others. There were twelve of them all together, forming a large circle around the solitary tower. She hadn't the faintest idea of what any of it meant. None of the marks here matched the three she'd spotted at Xavier's murder site. But there had to be some connection. So you truly can't read these? She asked her friend. No, Nehemia said curtly, and headed toward the hedges that bordered the courtyard. And you shouldn't try to discover what they say, she added over her shoulder. Nothing good will come of it. Selena pulled her cloak tighter around her as she followed after the princess. Snow would start falling in a matter of days, bringing them closer to Yulmus in the final duel. Still two months away, she savored the heat from her cloak, remembering all too well the winter she'd spent in Indovier. Winter was unforgiving when you lived in the shadow of the ruined mountains. It was a miracle she hadn't gotten frostbite. If she went back, another winter might kill her. You look troubled, Nehemia said when Selena reached her side and put a hand on her arm. I'm fine, Selena said in Eowe, smiling for Nehemia's sake. I don't like winter. I've never seen snow, Nehemia said, looking at the sky. I wonder how long the novelty will last. Hopefully long enough for you to not mind the drafty corridors, freezing mornings, and days without sunshine. Nehemia laughed. You should come to Eelway with me when I return, and make sure you stay long enough to experience one of our blistering summers. Then you'll appreciate your freezing mornings and days without sun. Selena had already spent one blistering summer in the heat of the Red Desert, but to tell Nehemia that would only invite difficult questions. Instead, she said, I'd like to see Eelway very much. Nehemia's gaze lingered on Selena's brow for a moment before she grinned. Then it shall be so. Selena's eyes brightened, and she tilted her head back so she could see the castle looming above them. I wonder if Kale sorted through the mess of that murder. My bodyguards tell me that the man was very violently killed. To say the least, Selena murmured, watching the shifting colors of the fading sun turn the castle gold and red and blue. Despite the ostentatious nature of the ca glass castle, she had to admit that it did look rather beautiful at times. You saw the body? My guards weren't allowed close enough. She nodded slowly. I'm sure you don't want to know the details. Indulge me, Nehemia pressed, smiling tightly. Selena raised an eyebrow. Well, there was blood smeared everywhere, everywhere on the walls, on the floor. Smeared, Nehemia said, her voice dropping into a hush. Not splattered? I think so. Like someone had rubbed it on there. There were a few of those word marks painted, but most had been rubbed away. She shook her head at the image that arose, and the man's body was missing its vital organs, like someone had split them open from neck to navel, and- I'm sorry, you look like you're going to be ill. I shouldn't have said anything. No, keep going. What else was missing? Selena paused for a moment before saying, his brain. Someone had made a hole on top of his head and his brain was gone, and the skin from his face had been ripped off. Nehemia nodded, staring at a barren bush in front of them. The princess chewed on her bottom lip, and Selena noted that her fingers curled and uncurled at her sides of her long white gown. A cold breeze blew past them, making Nehemia's multitude of fine, thin braids sway. The gold woven into her braids clinked softly. I'm sorry, Selena said. I shouldn't have. A step fell behind them, and before Selena could whirl, a male voice said, Look at this! She tensed as Kane came to stand nearby, half hidden in the shadow of the clock tower behind them. 
Baron, the curly-haired, loud-mouthed thief, was at his side. What do you want, she said. Kane's tan face twisted in a sneer. Somehow, he'd gotten bigger. Or maybe her eyes were playing tricks on her. Pretending to be a lady doesn't make you doesn't mean you are one, he said. Selena shot Nehemia a look, but the princess's eyes remained upon Kane, narrowed, but her eye her lips strangely slack. But Kane wasn't done, and his attention shifted to Nehemia. His lips pulled back, revealing his gleaming white teeth. Neither does wearing a crown make you a real princess. Not anymore. Selena took, took a step closer to him. Shut your stupid mouth or I'll punch your teeth down your throat and shut it for you. Cain let out a sharp laugh, which Baron echoed. The thief circled behind them, and Selena straightened, wondering if they'd actually pick a fight here. Lots of barking from the prince's lapdog, Cain said. But does she have any fangs? She felt Nehemia's hand on her shoulder, but she shrugged it off as she took another step toward him, close enough for the curls of his breath to touch her face. Inside the castle, the guards remained loitering about, talking amongst themselves. You'll find out when my fangs are buried in your neck, she said. Why not right now, Cain breathed. Come on, hit me. Hit me with all that rage you feel every time you force yourself to miss the bullseye, or when you slow yourself down so you don't scale walls as fast as me. Hit me, Lillian, he whispered so only she could hear. And let's see what that year in Endovier really taught you. Selena's heart leapt into a gallop. He knew. He knew who she was and what she was doing. She didn't dare to look at Nehemia, and only hoped her understanding of the common language was still weak enough for her not to have understood. Baron still watched from behind them. You think you're the only one whose sponsor is willing to do anything to win? You think your prince and captain are the only ones who know what you are? Selena clenched her hand. Two blows and he'd be on the ground, struggling to breathe. Another blow after that and Varen would be beside him. Lillian, Nehemia said in the common tongue, taking her by the lit hand. We have business. Let us go. That's right, Kane said. Follow her around like the lap dog you are. Selena's hand trembled. If she hit him, if she hit him, if she got into a brawl right here and the guards had to pull them apart, Kale might not let her see Nehemia again, let alone leave her rooms after lessons or stay late to practice with Knox. So Selena smiled and rolled her shoulders as she said brightly, Shove it up your ass, Kane. Kane and Varen laughed, but she and Nehemia walked away, the princess holding her hand tightly, not from fear or anger, but just to tell her that she understood, that she was there. Selena squeezed her hand back. It had been a while since someone had looked out for her, and Selena had the feeling she could get used to it. Kale stood with Dorian in the shadows atop the mezzanine, staring down at the assassin as she punched at the dummy situated in the center of the floor. She'd sent him a message saying she was going to train for a few hours after dinner, and he'd invited Dorian to come along to watch. Perhaps Dorian would now see why she was such a threat to him, to everyone. Selena grunted, throwing punch after punch, left, right, left, left, right, on and on, as if she had something burning inside of her that she couldn't quite get out. She looks stronger than before, the prince said quietly. You've done a good job getting her back into shape. Selena punched and kicked at the dummy, dodging invisible blows. The guards at the door just watched, their faces impassive. Do you think she stands a chance against Kane? Selena swung her leg through the air, connecting with the dummy's head. It rocked back. The blow would have knocked out a man. I think if she doesn't get too riled and keeps a cool head when they duel, she might. But she's wild and unpredictable she needs to learn to control her feelings especially that impossible anger which was true kale didn't know if it was because of endovie or just being an assassin whatever the cause of that unyielding rage she could never entirely leash herself who's that dorian asked sharply as Knox entered the room and walked over to selena she paused rubbing her wrapped knuckles and wiped the sweat from her eyes as she waved to him Knox, kale said a thief of Haran, minister jovel's champion Knox said something to selena that set her chuckling Knox laughed too. She made another friend? Dorian said, raising his brows as Lena demonstrated a move for Knox. She's helping him? Every day. They usually stay after lessons with the others are when the They usually stay after lessons with the others are over. And you allow this? Kale hit his glower at Dorian's tone. If you want me to put us into it, I will. Dorian watched them for another moment. No, let her train with him. The other champions are brutes. She could use an ally that she could. Dorian turned from the balcony and strode off into the darkness of the hall beyond. Kale watched the prince disappear, his red cape billowing behind him and sighed. He knew jealousy when he saw it, and while Dorian was clever, he was just as bad as Selena at hiding his emotions. Perhaps bringing the prince along had done the opposite of what he'd intended. His feet heavy, Kale followed after the prince, hoping Dorian wasn't about to drag them 
all into serious trouble. A few days later, Selena turned the crisp yellow pages of a heavy tome, squirming in her seat. Like the countless others she tried, it was just page after page of scribbling nonsense. It was, but it was worth researching. If there were word marks at Xavier's crime scene and word marks at the clock tower, the more she knew about what this killer wanted, why and how he was killing, the better. That was the real threat to be dealing with, not some mysterious, inexplicable evil Elena had mentioned. Of course, there was little to nothing to be found. Her eyes sore, the assassin looked up from the book inside. The library room was gloomy, and were it not for the sound of Kaol flipping pages, it would have been wholly silent. Done? he asked, closing the novel he was reading. She hadn't told him about Cain revealing what he that he knew who she really was, or the possible murder connection to the word marks. Not yet. Inside the library, she didn't have to think about competitions and brutes. Here, she could savor the quiet and the calm. No, she grumbled, drumming her fingers on the table. This is actually how you spend your spare time? A hint of a smile appeared on his lips. You should hope no one else hears about this. It would ruin your reputation. Knox would leave you for Kane. He chuckled to himself and opened his book again, leaning back in his chair. She stared after him for a moment, wondering if he'd stop laughing at her if he knew what she was researching, how it might help him, too. Slana strained in her chair, rubbing a nasty bruise on her leg. Naturally, it was from an intentional blow of Kale's wooden staff. She glared at him, but he continued reading. He was merciless during their lessons. He had her doing all sorts of activities, walking on her hands, juggling blades. It wasn't anything new, but it was unpleasant. But his temper had improved somewhat. He did seem a bit sorry for hitting her leg so hard. Slaina supposed she liked it. The assassin slammed shut the tone, thus flying into the air. It was pointless. What? He asked, straightening. Nothing, she grumbled. What were word marks? And where did they come from? And more importantly, why had she never heard of them before? They'd been all over Elena's tomb, too. An ancient religion from a forgotten time? What were they doing here and at the crime scene? There had to be a connection. So far, she hadn't learned much. According to one book, according to one book, word marks were an alphabet. Though according to this book, no grammar existed with the word marks. Everything was just symbols that one had to string together, and they changed meaning depending on the marks around them. They were painfully difficult to draw. They required precise lengths and angles, and they be or they became something else entirely. Stop flowering and sulking, Hale chided. He looked at the title of the book. Neither of them had mentioned Xavier's murder, and she'd gleaned no more information about it. Remind me what you're reading? Nothing, she said again, covering the book with her arms. But his brown eyes narrowed farther, and she sighed. It's just, just about word marks, those sundial things by the clock tower. I was interested, so I started learning about them. A half-truth, at least. She waited for a sneer and sarcasm, but it didn't come. He only said, and? Why the frustration? She looked at the ceiling, pouting. All I can find is just... Just radical and outlandish theories. I never knew any of this. Why? Some books claim the word is the force that holds together and governs Aurelia. Not just Aurelia, countless other worlds too. I've heard of it before, he said, picking up his book. But his eyes remained fixed on her face. I always thought the word was an old term for fate, or destiny. So did I. But the word is a religion, at least not in the northern parts of the continent. And it's not included in the worship of the goddess or the gods. He set the book in his lap. Is there a point to this, beyond your obsession with those marks in the garden? Are you that bored? Worried for my safety is more like it. No, yes, it's interesting. Some theories, some theories suggest the mother goddess is just a spirit from one of these other worlds, and that she strayed through something called a word gate and found Aurelia in need of form and light. That sounds a little sacrilegious, he warned. He was old enough to more vividly recall the burnings and executions ten years ago. What had it been like to grow up in the shadow of the king who had ordered so much destruction? To have lived here when royal families were slaughtered, when seers and magic wielders were burned alive, and the world fell into darkness and sorrow. But she went on, needing to dump the contents of her mind in case all the pieces somehow assembled by speaking them aloud. There was an idea that before the goddess arrived, there was light an ancient civilization, but somehow they disappeared, perhaps through that word gate thing. Ruins exist, ruins too old to be a fey making. How this connected to the champion murders was beyond her. She was definitely grasped with straws. He set his feet down and put the book on the table. Can I be honest with you? Kale leaned closer, and Slana leaned to meet him as he whispered. 
You sound like a raving lunatic. Selena made a disgusted noise and sat back, seething. Sorry for having some interest in the history of our world. As you said, these sound like radical and outlandish theories. He started reading once more and said without looking at her, again, why the frustration? She rubbed her eyes. Because, she said almost whining, because I just want a straightforward answer to what the word marks are and why they're in the garden here of all places. Magic had been wiped away on the king's orders, so why had something like the word marks been allowed to remain? To have them show up at the murder scene meant something. You should find another way to occupy your time, he said, returning to his book. Usually guards watched her in the library for hours on end, day after day. What was he doing here? She smiled, her heart skipping a beat, and then looked at the books on the table. She ran again through the information she'd gathered. There was also the idea of the word gates, which appeared numerous times alongside the mention of word marks, but she'd never heard of them. When she'd first stumbled across the notion of word gates, days ago, it had seemed interesting. And so she'd researched, digging through piles of old parchment, only to find more puzzling theories. The gates were both real and invisible things. Humans could not see them, but they could be summoned and accessed using the word marks. They opened into other realms, some of them good, some of them bad. Things could come through them from the other side and slither into Aurelia. It was due to this that many of the strange and foul creatures of Aurelia existed. Selena pulled another book toward her and grinned. It was as if someone had read her mind. It was a large black volume entitled The Walking Dead. It tarnished in tarnished silver letters. Thankfully, the captain didn't see the title before she opened it, but she didn't remember selecting this from the shelves. It reeked, almost like soil, and Slana's nose crinkled as she turned the pages. She scanned for any sign of the word marks or any mention of a word gate, but she soon found something far more interesting. An illusion of a twisted, half-decayed face grinned at her, flesh falling from its bones. The air chilled, and Slana rubbed her arms. Where had she found this? How had this escaped the burnings? How had any of these books escaped the purging fires ten years ago? She shivered again, almost twitching. The hollow, mad eyes of the monster were full of malice. She, it seemed to look at her. She closed the book and pushed it to the end of the table. If the king knew this kind of book still existed in his library, he'd have it all destroyed. Unlike the great library of Orin, here there were no master scholars to pro protect the invaluable books. Kale kept reading. Something groaned, and Selena had swung and Selena's head swung toward the back of the library. It was a guttural noise, an animalistic noise. Did you hear anything? she asked. When do you plan on leaving? was his only reply. When I grow tired of reading. She pulled the black book back to her, lifted past the terrifying portrait of the dead thing, and drew the candle closer to read the description of various monsters. There was a scraping noise somewhere beneath her feet, close as if someone were running a fingernail along the ceiling below. Selena slammed the book shut and stepped away from the table. The hair on her arms rose and she almost stumbled into the nearest table as she waited for something, a hand, a wing, a gaping, fanged mouth, to appear and grab her. Did you feel that? She asked Kale, who slowly, maliciously grinned. He held out his dagger and dragged it on the marble floor, creating the exact sound and feeling. Damned idiot, she snarled. She grabbed two heavy books from the table and stalked from the library, making sure to leave The Walking Dead far behind. <gasps> And we are done with chapter 27, which means we've managed to read another nine chapters. <laughs> and we are on page 210, which is officially, if I remember correctly, more than halfway done with the book. Yes, it is officially more than halfway done with the book. Shit. <laughs> Look at that, guys. Look at that. We could potentially get this done in another two or three readings. <laughs> and then we have seven more books to go. <laughs> um, After we're done with this one, though, we will have to sit down and have a vote of which book we want to read next. Yes. Because we can either read the next book that comes chronologically in the series, or there is a smaller book called The Assassin's Blade, which is a selection of um, short, like, stories that is a prequel to this book that gives more background on Selena's assassin life before she was captured. Um, 
I would have started with that book. But that book does not that book is not considered the first book of the series. Um so it doesn't do a great job at explaining Selena's back like Selena's story and who she is. Um and kind of like what's going on. So that one is like a we can either come we can read that one at any point in time during the um during the sequence of the eight books that we have. But I am going to stop the recording.